Um, the next session is one that um, I will um, open up with. Um, we will have some questions from uh, and commentary from uh, other members of the panel. Um, so sort of Dan, um, Ma, Carl, well Carl's not here, but Ma, um, Anne over on the left there, uh, and myself, um, and Andrew about talking about uh, capex bias. Um, uh, and then following that, uh, Raphael Del Croce uh, will, uh, who works in another arm of the OECD, will talk briefly about uh, some related work that uh, his team is working on. Um, so without further ado, I'll get into the, uh, into the presentation. I'll try and skip through this relatively quickly because um, we need to catch up a little bit of time. Um, a touch like Alex, I've, uh, <clears throat> I don't have the, uh, the creative or imaginative, imagine, imaginative skills. I mean, I'm not casting them on Alex, uh, equivalent to Diane's, to sort of put some diagrams together. So what you'll see is a lot of words. Um, um, so this, this presentation um, is essentially in two parts. The first part is some contextual information which draws upon some of the contributions from Dan, from Andrew, and uh, someone who's not here today, Nathan Zivov, who was with the working group and in fact worked with Diane uh, in the early parts of this project, but then um, got recalled to Australia. Um, back to the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission, which is our economic regulator in, um, or the principal economic regulator in Australia. And I want to use those, uh, 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 a few slides at the front of the presentation to provide some context for the rest of the presentation, which deals with <coughs> some of the challenges that we're grappling with in Australia about trying to move towards a RAB-based approach to um, Australia's road network. Um, just to quickly recap on some of those basic differences between uh, PPPs and RABs, we've, we've canvassed some of this before, but it's worth just quickly recapping. Um, you've got a long in the PPP case, you've got a long-term contract which um, sets down all the preconditions for the for the operation of the of the contract um, necessarily. Whereas on the RAB regulation, as, as we saw in I think one of those slides from Dayan. Uh, you've got a legally binding licence with these regular regulatory reviews. The principal elements in the contract for PPPs are about risk transfer and remuneration in the RAB um, environment. Um, you've still got this focus on outputs and service quality, um, but you've got price limits or revenue caps, um, the dominant part of the, uh, uh, the framework. Use the contracts for allocation of risk in PPPs, you have fixed prices and periodically in this re-regulation uh, process or renegotiation process. Um, you've got weaknesses around the financing costs, though I think Ma may or may not uh, comment on some of that. And you've got some issues in the RAB environment with CapEx bias, although uh, Dan would argue and might talk about later on that there are uh, differing views on some of that. Uh, and as we've been discussing in the last session, there's some issues around um, changes in uh, the environment in the PPP case versus um, the, the need for this stable institutional environment with RABs. One of the things that comes out in Dan's paper is, is just the, the criticality of having a stable and reliable regulatory structure and that a lot of that doesn't actually get written down in law, it's more, and John Stern, Professor John Stern, if he was here, would be saying it's, it's all about the behaviours and the, and, the, um, and the trust in the, in the relationships, um, and ultimately of the individuals. And so um, the success or otherwise of a RAB-based model depends a lot on having uh, an established, well-functioning institutional framework that's got a track record of um, being able to resist political interference, um, a credible appeals process that um, is not um, ridiculously costly um, and, and um, ultimately makes judgments in, a, in appeals cases that are that withstand scrutiny and credibility from or uh, scrutiny and and, um, and inquiry from um, uh, from the parties that are affected 
um, and that there's this in, inbuilt reinforcing of, the, of good behaviours, good regulatory behaviours from government agencies. And the other part, uh, the other really critical factor is this issue of, of a credible funding commitment, whether it's, whether it's the regulator providing uh, the owner with the legal opportunity to, to raise charges and, and um, revenues in a, in a particular form, or whether it's continuing and ongoing commitments from government to contribute their finances to the uh, success of the project and keeping the, the, op the owner of the asset um, financially whole. Does a RAB depend on user charges? Um, no, it doesn't, as Diane was just saying earlier on, because um, it's about um, uh, the RAB's licensing is, and the process of using a RAB involves um, a focus on consumer protection. The independent regulatory authority sets those maximum charges. It is open, I won't be able to skip through this, but it is open for governments to continue to provide ongoing financial supports through availability payments and the like to underpin uh, the, the regulatory arrangement. <coughs> Andrew's uh, paper spoke um, about CapEx bias. It's been one of the, the concerns um, with RAB-related uh, uh, environments. Um, and although these exist, or the, 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 the theoretically the reasons exist, it's not so clear that there is a, a clear body of evidence to demonstrate that that's the case. Um, and you can, agencies, the regulators can use top-down benchmarking and, and more specific studies when they're doing regulatory reviews. Um, and that these are some um, you know, useful means of dealing with this, this uh, perception or perceived or, uh, uh, risk of a capex bias being built into the regulatory determinations. Andrew's paper also um, addresses some of the, the more recent moves towards a, a focus on TOTEX, one that takes account not only of capex but also operational and maintenance expenditures and trying to get a um, whole of project, whole of, whole of asset view about what costs the owner is facing and in turn what revenues they will need to be able to meet those costs and provide a, a reasonable uh, risk-adjusted return. I won't talk about financial engineering other than to say that um, it has been an issue um, with PPPs in particular, but also with RABs. Um, and what I might do now is turn to the final the preparatory slides uh, and then we'll get on to um, some of the issues that were the focus of my paper. The third paper was one by, as I say, by Nathan Zivov, and uh, it concerned um, the Thames Tideway Tunnel in London. A tunnel that was, um, it's a bit hard to read all of that, but essentially um, a very large project uh, that was uh, established to deal with um, flooding and other issues uh, in, that, in that catchment, and a very large and very complex project. Complex in terms of engineering, but complex also in terms of its uh, the contractual environment that it was um, established into. And there were different elements of this, this approach um, where the funding was guaranteed through regulated charges. There was a lot of homework done up front to pick up that debate from earlier this morning. There was an incentive <laughs> framework. There was um, um, government supports to deal with exceptional risks. Um, and there were these separate competitions, both for the construction of the of the project and and its financing. And in summary, uh, the paper outlines the the broad approach of using a PPP in the construction phase of the project and moving towards a RAB environment or RAB uh, management of um, its operations and, and uh, funding of its maintenance and the like. The conclusion the paper comes to is that um, it's a fairly unique set of circumstances there um, and it may not be um, easy to replicate those circumstances in other environments, but I think it's worth thinking about um, as drawing some lessons from it where we can about as we move from an environment where governments will use, continue to use a lot of PPPs for road projects but perhaps we can move them into a, um, a broader RAB environment and the question of the integration of PPP-delivered projects into a RAB environment needs further discussion, which I'll come to.
Um, why do we in Australia have an interest in investigating uh, a RAB for our road network? Um, uh, or, and more generally, a corporatisation of our road um, road agencies. Um, and that's what um, we're at Infrastructure Australia have been doing some work recently, and, uh, and there are others in Australia who are also looking to address this issue. The, the lessons that um, we're, in, in, frankly, in the early stage of drawing, I think will have some implications for how other countries might approach this issue. So why consider it? Um, we need investment. We've been growing uh, very rapidly uh, and we need investment in road transport to support economic growth and social objectives, all the things that we're familiar with. The governments are under uh, fiscal pressures, just like um, your governments are. Um, I'm not sure whether your, age, your governments do this, but we, um, every five years, our, our Australian government has to prepare a, um, a so-called intergenerational report, which uh, makes a 40-year projection of government finances under certain base cases. And the last one of those projected that on a um, no policy change basis, our uh, the, the fiscal gap between revenues and expenditures was likely to blow out to about 6% of GDP um, every year, year on year, and that didn't include um, interest costs. And so um, the risk or the challenge is that if we don't address the fiscal gap in one way or another or find alternate revenues in the case of roads, that it'll be harder and harder for governments to fund um, the uh, uh, maintenance, much less the development of the road network. Um, there have been issues with PPPs, um, inefficient risk transfer. We've had three or four of them uh, collapse financially in Australia over the last 10 years. And we have a, a rich experience with using RABs in the in other sectors, in electricity and uh, water and, and gas and so on, and, and it's worked well there. And, and we have on the whole, we've got quite good regulatory um, agencies. We've also used um, private investment, um, and it's in Australia's infrastructure networks. So it's um, we see it in telecoms, we see it in energy, uh, both in the generation side of electricity and in the networks. We see it in gas, again, extraction and networks, and we see it um, in water. So we're not, as a country, we're not afraid to pay user charges for our infrastructure. But what about transport? A um, bit consistent with the, the analysis that Alex uh, presented earlier on, <coughs> we've seen quite a lot of in private investment in airports, the larger airports and the, our ports, following the privatisation of those assets over the last 10 years on the whole. There has been rather less investment in land transport, um, a few light rail projects and some station uh, projects associated with what are otherwise publicly developed or publicly funded uh, lines. Uh, there are some dedicated <coughs> mineral lines in the northwest of Australia where the, the just the economics stacks up, and the and the 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 mining companies will happily pay for the cost of the railways to make sure they reliably get their product to port. And uh, there are, I think, I should be clear on this. I think there's 16 PPPs. It might be one more actually. Um, Existing road PPPs. Um, the first one dates back from about 1989, uh, and there are three other contracts under delivery in one form or another. Two for a, um, which are uh, quite large uh, urban motorways, and the third and the most recent is an interesting one, which is um, uh, a 20 year contract for maintenance of uh, the arterial road network in Western Melbourne. Uh, and it's fundamentally about maintenance, but it's also got some um, some provisions for construction of, of smaller scale improvements to the network. And we see private investment also in, in freight transport um, and in, in the passenger, uh, some elements of the passenger rolling stock, the, the above ground uh, assets. So on to, to roads. We have a large road network, um, uh, 870 odd thousand kilometres. It's one of the, on a particular on a per capita basis, it's one of the largest in the world. Um, we actually don't really know how much the network is lost, is worth rather. It's, we think it's about, you know, best the calculation I could come to looking at annual reports and some other other evidence was about 470 billion. We spend 
a fair amount on our road network, about 1.4% of GDP, um, which is a bit higher than the OECD average after the last few years. But nevertheless, we still have some evidence of underspending on maintenance. Um, reports by various state auditor generals have shown that to be the case. And although we've got a large or long history of um, involvement with PPPs, they are still a vanishingly small part of our road network, less than 0.03% of the overall road network. Uh, but important parts because they're typically um, smack bang in the middle of our big urban areas. I said before, we've had a couple of financial failures and that changed the risk appetite. The private sector will no longer, um, I won't say no longer, but is has, has completely changed its position on, on demand. Um, they used to invest and take uh, demand risk, absolutely. But there were important differences between the first round of projects in the in the mid early um, 1990s and through to the early 2000s, where um, by and large, they were projects that were filling manifest and obvious gaps in the road network. So there was going to be high latent demand and high expectation that uh, users would be prepared to pay a reasonable cost to, to reduce their travel times. The other consideration was that they were largely being built on road reservations that had been protected or set aside 20 and 30 years ago so they could be cheap projects built at the surface. The next generation of projects were probably in corridors or in locations where the demand wasn't so evident and they were having to be built in tunnel. And that combination of um, demand not being quite as strong as it was in the first round and much higher costs associated with the tunnels caused a number of these financial failures. We have a high degree of vertical fiscal imbalance between our levels of government. 80% of government taxation revenues in Australia are collected by the Australian government but the road spending is still by the state or territorial government, so there's a big fiscal transfers. Road use is moderated per capita, but because we've got this rapid growth, about 1.6% uh, per annum growth in population in particular, um, and especially in the cities, the four big capital cities, um, it's going to grow. We need to improve the efficiency of our road investment. Um, we've got lots of cases where projects with quite poor benefit-cost ratios and no other obvious um, compelling strategic reason they've been getting funded. And they're, and they're not small projects. They're, in some cases, these are hundreds of millions and one or two cases, billions of dollars of Australian money. So it's um, given those fiscal challenges, long, medium and longer term fiscal challenges, we've just got to get better at that. Um, and we, the, we need to also use, in our view, corporatisation and the establishment of a RAB as a basis for moving towards a new form of road funding. Uh, as is common around the world, um, as cars are becoming more fuel efficient, the fuel excise, which is the dominant road-related revenue, has been falling at the same time as the usage of the roads has been increasing. Um, and we need a more transparent governance framework to address some of the, the funding and, and capital spending priorities and the like that that are going to confront us as a country. We've got reasonable building blocks starting um, point where we are right now. We've been having some form of heavy vehicle charging now for 20-odd uh, years or more um, related, but it's usually an attempt to put a, um, levies on trucks to get um, recover past expenditure. We're now in the early days of looking to establish a, a forward-looking cost base, essentially uh, a, the equivalent of a... Um, a RAB type uh, approach to charging for heavy vehicles. We're starting to build up asset registers for the main road networks. There's a, um, again, starting a discussion about having a road data standard so that we can um, acquire consistent data across our, certainly at least our main road networks and, and hopefully also some of the local road networks. There is a um, a review by the Australian Government and the State Governments at the moment which is scheduled to report at the end of the year about having an economic regulator for the road network in respect of heavy vehicles and the Government has made uh, uh, an announcement about an inquiry into charging of light vehicles although it has to be said that that announcement was made 18 months ago and they haven't yet actually um, formally established uh, the inquiry. 
uh, I think most commentators would see that light vehicle charging is um, a good uh, 15 to 20 years away. Um, we need this, um, uh, what are the, some of the key issues? An architecture which allows an evolutionary approach to moving from where we are now to hopefully over 20 years um, a light vehicle charging system. We need a discussion about which road networks to regulate. We don't, Australia's road networks are in some ways, important ways, quite different to um, other countries where uh, we've got these vast distances and we don't have a, a relatively contained and discrete motorway uh, network. Um, that's not to say we can't move towards that and that might still be a focus for our, our efforts, but there's a, a debate to be had about how much of the road network would go into a, a RAB model. We need to uh, hypothecate the road revenues. There'll be a, an ex a really difficult discussion about service levels and where we spend our scarce capital, whether, you know, we've got a, a so-called defined national land transport network that runs from the main parts of Sydney, the central parts of Sydney, up to remote areas of Australia that would be lucky to carry 500 vehicles a day. It's still defined as our part of our national land transport network um, because of a, a, our conception of our country, our, the way we perceive ourselves as um, one large country that needs to be connected we need some maturity in the way these intergovernmental issues will get handled. That raises issues about how large the bundles of the roads will be so that we can do benchmarking. There's a really complex issue around how to incorporate existing and prospective PPPs into the RAB with or without reform of the tolling. The role of the regulator versus government agencies where um, if governments are still funding the vast majority of the roads at least for a time, um, there's a, going to be a, a political, both um, interagency inter political and public political uh, debate about who's who's calling the shots. We need to learn from the regulators or regulation experience in other sectors. There was in the electricity sector in the 1990s. There was gaming by the uh, electricity entities, the network entities, um, which allowed them to uh, earn some premium returns. And we need to just get on with it because, we're, frankly, we're not, we're only slightly ahead of where we were 10 years ago. This has been debated in the country since at least 2006, and we haven't moved on very far. Uncertainties, uh, I've got another two or three slides. <clears throat> the technological change, the impact of AVs and ride sharing, we've mentioned some of that. We're doing some work um, at the present time, which is looking at um, how we, how governments are um, dealing with the potential change in the underlying demand for transport in business cases and trip rates and affordability. On the one hand, <clears throat> you know we hear McKinsey and others saying that there'll be we'll lose 30% of jobs, um, um, but um, and that has a fundamental importance for project conception and demand at morning peak hour demand and things like that. The work we've done to date shows that in terms of the, the business cases that have come through for some of the really big and expensive multi-billion dollar projects, there has been absolutely no consideration of that, even though it's been publicly debated now for, for five years or more, um, that there's still this assumption of a continuation of full employment. That may not come to pass. And so there's an arguable case that we're, we're in, um, investing in, in projects that are going to prove to be overscoped. <laughs> And we've got high, and we've got other housing changes in the housing preferences about where people want to live. Much greater um, propensity for people to want to live in closer to the city. Climate change is an obvious risk on the cost side. Um, we've got when the future roads going to be more more of an tunnel um, because we don't want roads carving up the middle of our cities. Um, and we we have this issue that um, we don't actually know as much as we'd like to think we do about the, the quality of the assets. And the final point, again, it goes back to some of the discussion in the previous session, is just this, there's an uncertainty about the stability of governments. I mean, populism uh, and contested policy is, is prevalent all around the world. And I think there's a, um, it would be remarkable if Australia was immune from those sorts of uh, challenges that, that um, uh, other countries face. And whether there's a stability, and this goes to the issue of credible commitment in terms of funding, um, uh, that... Uh, will face. <clears throat>
and, and particularly around service levels and the level of a community service obligation payments to, to provide a reasonable level of service in certain parts of Australia. Um, we don't really know how the private sector might invest in, in a RAB re regulated network. Um, uh, just because we we're too early in the process, but I think it's likely that what we'll see is just this investment by the private uh, maintenance and construction uh, um, parties in uh, discrete parts of the network, perhaps buying more productivity enhancing um, systems. Um, and there'll be uh, developers of new tollways. I don't think we're, we're going to stop having PPPs uh, and individual tollway links. Um, but somehow we've got to work our way through about how those new existing and new PPPs will sit within a, a broader system. Um, the, I'll just go back to that last point. There's a, a real competition issue as well. I, it's, that's, I was talking to Mar and, and others this morning about, which is uh, Transurban is a very large tollway operator in Australia and overseas. It owns, I think it's 13 out of the 17 odd tollways or 14 out of 17, um, and uh, the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission, the economic regulator, has uh, is now drawing to the conclusion of a uh, an inquiry as to whether Transurban should be allowed to bid for a very, very large PPP contract in Sydney, a $17 billion uh, project, and its report will come down in the next few weeks, and it's going to be a... And, and, only a matter of weeks before the tender process for that project um, concludes, so it's going to be a fascinating uh, to see which way the which way the regulator lands or where they land, and the reaction uh, from the market uh, to that to that report. Um, final final slide, um, just to recap: we've had a long history of private investment. We need reform uh, around. Um, governance and funding, the reform has been slow. That reform needs to occur and we see, at Infrastructure Australia, we see um, reform towards corporatisation of our road agencies and, and, and moving towards a, some form of shadow RAB and maybe in a, a few years a, a more conventionally regulated, um, uh, regulated asset base as a no regret step. We will get, we will still get benefits from better project selection, we will still get benefits from better um, transparency in decision making, um, and we can, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, these, are, these are actions that are required in any event if we are to go down a path towards greater user charging on the road network. It's going to be one of these, the truly most complex policy reform processes that Australia's ever undertaken, both because of its scale and, and just the uncertainties that I've alluded to in the previous slides. Um, and this evolution from PPPs to RABs uh, uh, is something that I, I think needs further thought. Um, uh, and perhaps there's some, um, some lessons in things like Thames Tideway um, or other other environments where there's this evolutionary uh, prospect. So on that note, I'll, I'll finish.